There we go. Good. Okay, so CAD at this point is going to be a fair amount of a review. So um, tell me what you know or what you uh, <clears throat> what you remember about CAD at this point. So we we got this in two parts, but what is uh, what is your give me a basic summary of what CAD is and how it affects the heart and how we see it. I'm thinking like anything that affects the coronary arteries so that the heart isn't properly supplied and perfused with blood. A very right. general thing on it, but like overall. Most of the time, what disease process is causing it? Uh, isn't that like plaque buildup? Yeah. Atherosclerosis. What's another name for plaque buildup? Doesn't have to be Mike answering everyone, by the way. Although you, you're welcome to. Do you mean stenosis? Uh, yeah, what's another name for the plaque buildup? Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, good. So yeah, we're looking usually at an atherosclerotic process. Um, we're going to be, so when we talk about uh, issues in the heart, what do we see in echo? What do we wall see? motion abnormalities. Yes, wall motion abnormalities, good. Uh, so we see wall motion abnormalities. How do we document? How do we quantify? Scores. Okay, we score it. So that's a semi-quantitative, right? So we, we put a score on a visual estimation because that's highly accurate. Ejection fraction. Ejection. Strain. Good, yes. Start out with the last one. Strain. Strain imaging could be used. Yeah, absolutely. So good, there's different ways to measure it. So generally speaking, we want to show it. Um, so if I'm going to show wall motion abnormalities, what echo images am I going to show? Your stress images. Okay, definitely the stress images because they show all 17 wall segments. Good. Uh, and anything that shows the walls and stuff like that is definitely you know, in, in motion. I can't obviously do much with showing a still picture of the walls. Um, and modes could be helpful uh, where we see walls and stuff like that also. So things that we could use to, to show it. Um, is there any generally uh, hemodynamic changes because of um, CAD, you think? Stenosis. It can be. Okay, so yeah, there's a stenosis directly in the coronary arteries. Do we see those? Not in the coronary arteries, no. Well, I mean, I don't know if you could see it at the bait, the ostium at the root level. Good. So we can actually see the proximal segments of them. We're not going to see them out onto the wall of the heart. Are they big enough to see with ultrasound? Yes. Uh, the problem is there's so much motion and stuff going on, so much lung artifact and things around it. Uh, it's very difficult to see visually as it's beating. So could we? Yes, if the heart was still. Um, but if, obviously, if the heart is still, then uh, our imaging is not going to be that helpful. Right. Um, so, yeah, we could see it. We do see the wall motion abnormalities in the walls themselves. We demonstrate that. Uh, what about other hemodynamic changes possibly do you think might happen? To cause no blood flow to the valves or the papillary muscles. Okay, so yeah, so we could do damage to the papillary muscles internally because they're not getting blood supply and that can damage and rupture and stuff like that. So we'll talk more about that today. Um, Hemodynamics, what? would you have a reduced ejection fraction, reduced stroke volume? Yes, absolutely to all that, yes. So reduced stroke volume, reduced uh, ejection fraction. So we're taking Simpsons and that, we expect that the Simpsons is gonna be lower. Um, do you expect the shape of the heart to be the same? Depends on if it's ischemia or injury. Right, good. So if it's early, early on, no, we don't expect much of a change. Maybe a bit of a dilation um, on the early stages, but as it as it progresses into days and weeks and hours, even uh, we're going to start to notice uh, volume changes uh, fairly decently, and we call that remodeling. Uh, so we're going to see a reshaping of what's going on. So we're going to look for all those kinds of things. We're going to document those kinds of things. We're going to measure those kinds of things. Uh, as we do our echo. So the, the most important part of echo uh, doing CAD is seeing the walls in motion 
and then documenting those via clips, um, particularly um, those stress echo images as Kelsey had suggested as well. So <clears throat> we'll go into there. Could there be other things that cause a restrictor? So we talked about atherosclerosis as a process. Um, now, we are going to separate from CAD. CAD is atherosclerotic disease, OK? But can you have a heart attack without atherosclerotic disease being the cause? Yes, OK? You can have congenital things where you know we've got uh, coronary arteries that that bifurcate in the wrong locations, that get pinched between vessels and structures, uh, that causes a restriction in those. So those types of things can cause a heart attack, but not all heart attacks are a cause of CAD. Okay, so CAD is specifically atherosclerotic disease. Okay, so as stated, atherosclerotic disease is what we're looking at. Um, <clears throat> we can include stable and unstable angina. Uh, acute myocardial infarction, ischemia, or ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, with congestive heart failure and sudden death. So there's a whole bunch of uh, presentations uh, basically that we're going to have from our patients and, and what we see on the heart itself. Our job then is, uh, as we just suggested, we want to diagnose, we want to, we want to narrow down our differential uh, to be showing you know more precisely what the cause of this problem is that the patient is experiencing so we diagnose it we detect any possible complications because of it so what's a possible complication do you think um so we just finished talking about valves and chambers and stuff like that and leaky stuff and stenotic stuff what what do you think might be a secondary effect of a um so kelsey mentioned the uh, papillary muscle possibly rupturing or being damaged uh, what if that tore off? What kind of a secondary effect would we see because of that? Like a hemorrhage. Okay, so it could be a hemorrhage. We're not necessarily going to see the hemorrhage, but uh, what's immediately going to happen if you tore that papillary muscle off? Uh, big, time regurgitation. big time regurgitation. Absolutely acute, uh, sudden pressure changes, all that kind of stuff. So we expect to see a great big leak immediately if that tore away. Uh, so those are like secondary signs of things going on. So in, in a less extreme example, you, if we're having a, a dilation issue because we get that reshaping or remodeling of the heart after we've had a heart attack, so we get a weaker area that kind of expands out, maybe becomes aneurysmal. Um, it pulls away, and, and typically your papillary muscles pull towards the apex, so it goes away from the valve, which then doesn't let the valve shut all the way because the chordae tendinae are tethering it back to those papillary muscles. So we may see um, leaky mitral valve without having a flail leaflet and stuff like that. We might actually just have a significantly, uh, because of the chamber size, dilation of the annulus and uh, tethering of those cords, holding it back, not allowing it to shut and collapse properly and uh, allowing a big leak to occur. And again, being a sudden change uh, or a fairly sudden change, again, the heart's not going to tolerate that super well. The patient is going to be pretty symptomatic. Okay, um, so again, our job, go through, assess all that, um, and then assess the uh, possible prognosis as well could be part of our uh, thing. So we have diagnosis. We, we know what diagnosis is. Uh, that's determining what is the cause of the disease as, as precisely as we can. What is a prognosis? outcome how this is going to be developed and what is the end result of this it really just depends on how long it lasts or something yeah so i think uh, and kathleen i think is the one that commented uh, i didn't see um, your face doesn't necessarily pop up but sometimes i see a bit of a green screen um <clears throat> so prognosis is really is the outcomes is what uh what's going to happen after the fact so how can echo be useful in assessing a prognosis after somebody's had a heart attack we can estimate the severity of which like vessel is involved or how many vessels okay good so we can determine what's exactly causing it after that so they don't usually come to us. They, they come to us in stress tests and things like that, but when they're, when they're gonna have a heart attack, they don't come to us immediately. We usually see the after effects of a heart attack. Nancy, you have a Yeah, that would be, you could get that information from an EKG. Right. 
Yeah, so you could get that information uh, from that, but uh, what we can see is uh, an, an EKG won't show you a, a mitral regurgitation, for example, whereas echo can then take and quantify what's going on. We can determine how bad it is, and if, if needed, we could actually follow up depending on how fresh that, that MI is. We could follow up and see if that's progressively getting worse or if it's becoming stable. Uh, in our world, uh, stability is very, very important. Uh, when things are unstable, that's when things get dangerous. That's when, that's when we risk rupturing capillary muscles and tearing holes in walls, causing leaks and things like that. So, we want to we want to get more of a stable state, and uh, echo can help to determine if we are on that path of stability or if uh, things are progressively getting worse. So we can help prognose or give a prognosis, uh, you know, so that they can plan differently to change the outcome for that patient if uh, things start to change. Good. All right. <clears throat> so again, we can skip through some of this pretty quickly. This should be a pretty good refresher between Darren's class and, and EKG and what we've already talked about in ECHO uh, to some degree, but we'll go through it uh, nonetheless. So basically it is an interruption in the normal blood supply, as you know. So the ischemic cascade is uh, something to always keep in mind as far as what timing of events uh, happens and when can we see these things and, and how can we the idea of medicine is always that we want to intervene as, as early as we can, because if we can do that, we can prevent permanent damage from taking place. We can actually be perfused. This is why your door to balloon time uh, for cath lab is 90 minutes, right? Um, how long does it take tissue to die, roughly? Mm, four hours. And it depends on the tissue. So some tissue is more sensitive than others. I will say, you know, from, and I just happen to know this because of the, uh, you know, in uh, testicular and ovarian torsion, uh, meaning when the blood supply gets cut off, uh, we have six hours before that tissue dies, okay? And the heart may be more or less slightly, why is it a 90 minute door to balloon time? Because we don't know how long it was that the blood supply got cut off before they actually got the patient to the hospital admitted and uh, in, into the cath lab to perform the procedure. That's why they, their door to balloon time is 90 minutes because they don't know how long it has taken before. Um, brain tissue, if it's been uh, starved of oxygen for uh, several minutes, can have permanent brain damage. Uh, they can have uh, brain tissue death um, you know, within hours and stuff like that. So that time really is, is really important. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we will interrupt that. We get the ischemic cascade. Uh, again, the ischemic cascade idea is that uh, if we can determine these things faster uh, or sooner, then we can intervene sooner and there's a better outcome for the patient. Uh, I'll use another quick example. So TPA is a medication that uh, I believe is still currently off-label use for strokes. That helps to um, recover from a blood clot and things like that. So when they, when they did some studies, they could give this TPA to a patient, um, and if they give it systemically, uh, meaning that they just inject it into the body, um, there's blood clots that usually get into the brain and causes uh, the thromboembolism that causes strokes, and that can dissolve um, and, uh, and be gone and recover and reperfuse, but that takes about 36 hours to recover if you inject it generally. Uh, there were some studies done, this is going back probably, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now, where they actually did studies with, with contrast and uh, actually putting the medications inside the contrast uh, uh, bubbles. And so instead of that, uh, that, um, that inert gas that they normally use, like the perflutrin, um, they have medication in there. And so what they'll do is they target it because we know that we cavitate or rupture the bubbles uh, with the intensity of the ultrasound. So they'd actually put a TCD, like a head unit on the TCD, and they could target it and rupture the bubbles at the site, delivering the medication specifically to that area, rather than letting it go through the entire body. And by doing that, they reduced the recovery time from 36 hours to recovery to six hours recovery, which is huge in a stroke patient. So that's the difference between uh, permanent neurological damage and being able to recover what's going on. Uh, with the heart, same thing. We want to get in as quickly as we can, uh, unobstruct what's going on. And if uh, they can do that with the cath lab, um, they may be able to do some treatment with uh, medications using um, 
uh, nitrous and stuff like that, but um, they also may need to go in to do uh, open heart surgery and do a bypass graft and things like that. So it depends on what they find uh, and what they're able to do, but we want to do it fast. So obstruction less than four hours leads to necrosis. Okay, it's not immediate necrosis, but uh, it leads towards uh, necrosis and uh, permanent uh, regional wall motion abnormality. So the RWMA is regional wall motion abnormality. Okay, as opposed to global. Okay, global uh, wall motion abnormalities means that all the walls are kind of doing the same thing, uh, but it's suggesting that they're all kind of sluggish or whatever is going on. Uh, that can be caused by CAD, but it doesn't have to be. It can be caused by something else like an infection or a virus or something like that. Um, four to six hours becomes irreversible. So that tissue is then going to lead to permanent, uh, permanent damage. Uh, ischemia is about a 20 to 60 minute delay. We have delayed recovery or uh, stunning. Uh, 30 to 60 minutes, we have... Um, equals about 24 to 72 hour delay in recovery. So it depends on how early again that happens. The later it is, the, the longer the recovery uh, becomes. Uh, an occlusion less than five minutes, we have a recovery of 60 to 120 seconds, okay? And this goes back to why we do what we do in stress echo, needing to get our images in 60 to 90 seconds because then uh, if they've had an occlusion that happens, that's kind of a temporary thing and um, we wait too long to get our pictures, the heart will recover to normal and you won't see those regional wall motion abnormalities and then we misdiagnose the patient, they go away thinking that they didn't have a heart attack or, or unlikely to have one. Then they go out and do their regular activities and then end up having a heart attack and that's never looks good for us, but I mean, obviously our, our main concern is really the patient. Uh, so keeping those uh, images down as, as low of time frame as you can is, is better for the patient. Um, repetitive episodes are worse than one timers. So just like a in series stenosis or a series of stenoses, um, the more of them there are, the worse it becomes. So in the heart, the more episodes that we have, the worse it becomes. Uh, you could say the same for TIAs and strokes as well. The more of those that we get, the cumulatively, the, the worse it becomes for the patient. Okay, just a picture of the ischemic cascade. Again, it's just one representation of it. There's all kinds of uh, graphs and stuff on, online if you want to Google some. But just to kind of review, um, the main thing is, is when, when the patient comes to us, they're usually complaining of this one. So that's angina. Okay. Um, uh, so angina is kind of the one that uh, they notice something and they, you know, the patient actually gets off their um, derriere and uh, comes in and uh, does something about it. Uh, if we're doing like a stress test, for example, uh, we've got a normal functioning heart. The earliest thing that would happen to be visualized if we're seeing it um, is a perfusion. So we can, we, I've got it. There's an echo image here of perfusion, which we could do. Uh, using the echo enhancing agent. So that's kind of a specialized use of that. Um, more appropriately, if they're concerned about this and we're doing like a stress test, so this would be done in a nuclear medicine lab and they detect things very early on. They're actually seeing the defect of filling um, and they are better at it than we are, even though we can do it, okay? Next thing is, uh, is diastolic dysfunction. Um, how do we take diastolic function? What measurements do we do for diastolic function? The E and the A velocity, the D cell time. Yeah. Um, we look at pulmonary veins, hepatic veins. Yes. So tissue Doppler, micro inflow, uh, pulmonary veins, all that kind of stuff. That's all diastolic function. Those are all Doppler based things, right? Uh, we can do strain imaging to see some of that as well. Strain is the next thing on the ischemic cascade. Um, but I will say that when we're doing stress tests, we uh, it's not uncommon now to um, throw some of that diastolic function stuff in. Um, the 60 to 90 seconds applies to the regional wall motion changes. So uh, even though diastolic dysfunction is earlier in the ischemic cascade, um, we actually will document uh, the walls first because we got 60 to 90 seconds and then we take the Dopplers after. Um, the Doppler effects seem to last a little longer, okay? So it's okay to take the Doppler after you've done your initial stress echo imaging. 
uh, but you got to see the walls first. That's that's most important. Um, unless you're doing a debutamine study or you are doing a an incline bicycle or something like that where the patient is actively exercising while you're seeing these wall motion changes, then perhaps you can do the diastolic function first. And while you're kind of waiting for your images, maybe throwing on a Doppler to see how the Doppler changes their effect. Uh, that would be appropriate because you're you're actively exercising. But once we've stopped the treadmill and we get the patient over to bed, uh, we need to get get right on the wall. Okay, so screen imaging is the next in line, uh, and then visualizing the abnormality of the wall motion. So this is where we would actually see it on echo, um, and you'll be scanning, and you would act. So if you're again doing a debutamine or an inclined bicycle, um, or a reclined bicycle, you'd see. Um, you'd see the walls start to change. The chamber may dilate slightly. Uh, you'll see wall segments become more sluggish, okay, compared to normal. And uh, you'll see that right away. Uh, and then beyond that, we see the EKG changes. And after the EKG changes, then we get the chest change. So that's where they become symptomatic. Um, and then much later down there, we get infection and, and uh, or infarction, excuse me, and scarring uh, that develops down the road. That's much longer term. Okay, uh, Nancy, go ahead. So the, this, the uh, ischemic cascade, does that happen over 90 seconds or does that happen, like what's the time frame for that? Does it repeatedly happen with, with ischemia? I'm... Let me go back to it. So it's a good question. Um, we have the 60 to 90 seconds. The reason we use the 60 to 90 seconds is because if we don't see it here, um, we might miss what's been happening. If you're to do it, uh, if you have active exercise going on, like in debutamine or on that the incline bicycle, uh, you would see it while that's happening. Uh, we're usually looking at it on a treadmill stress test after you've already finished the, the, the test is actually finished and now you're seeing the after effects of it. Uh, that's where our recovery comes in. And the point is there is that, uh, you know, it, it can change, but they can be experiencing angina while they're on the treadmill. Okay. Uh, so that does happen. So it's variable between the patients. Um, and some patients, what we have to be careful of is diabetes, for example. Uh, they've got diabetic neuropathy, but they may not even know that they're having symptoms. Okay, they don't they don't experience the pain that the rest of us do. Uh, so the, I mean, obviously, diabetic patients not only are the more susceptible to developing plaque buildup, especially if they're smokers, uh, even more so. But now they don't feel the pain either, and so they don't notice it until it's very much too late. Okay, so for diabetics in particular, you want to pay close attention because you may not get the signs and symptoms from the patient. Okay, so, but yes, the, the answer to that is that angina is going to be a little bit variable per person. Okay, so remodeling again, just think, uh, think of remodeling a house. Um, when we remodel a house, usually we're changing things up where, you know, this isn't just shifting around furniture and stuff like this. This is actually, you know, busting out a wall, removing it, maybe adding a different one in, you know, so think of that the same as the heart. Uh, when we remodel, I'm going to talk about remodeling in two ways. One is kind of the natural path of remodeling, which is that things tend to get worse, okay? Sort of like the law of entropy that uh, things, you know, go from a normal state to uh, progressively more disorganized. Um, so eventually your, your walls and stuff generally dilate and stuff like that. That's, that's kind of what I would consider a negative remodeling. Um, when we do therapy, part of the therapy we can do nowadays is like pacemaking. And with pacemakers, we can actually positively remodel by re-strengthening those muscles. It's sort of like doing PT for the heart. Uh, you re-strengthen the muscles so that it brings it back uh, towards the normal. It will never be normal, but you bring it back towards that. So remodeling is simply just reshaping uh, from the natural state. So it takes about six weeks uh, for a necrosis to turn to scar, okay? Once it becomes scarred, it's pretty strong. So if you've ever had uh, cuts and stuff and you get that uh, fibrous uh, cartilaginous, or not cartilaginous, but um, that fibrous type of uh, scar tissue, you, you know, it's very, very tough. Okay, that's the body's way of healing things and, and it almost becomes stronger than your makes the regular tissue. It's not as functional as regular tissue. That, um, 
So the, the scar is a stable portion. In between the time that the MI happens and the six weeks, uh, that's kind of a weak phase. And during that time, we might become aneurysmal, you know, where things start to stretch out. Uh, myocardial expansion or that weakening of the walls or stretching of the walls starts to happen uh, at around 48 hours. So, um, so that's where it might start to stretch into like an aneurysm and become thinner walls. Uh, acute thinning uh, is a very weak stage. So the strong stage is when it's scarred. Uh, the weak stage is when it's stretching. Um, obviously, as you uh, extrapolate that, if, if we have that weak wall and it continues to go too much and we have a spike in pressure or something like that, we can actually rupture that wall, uh, causing a leak outside the heart, which is not good, or uh, a leak between chambers like the interventricular septum, for example or torn capillary muscle, those are the times that that type of stuff happens. Um, <clears throat> so within that first six weeks is a, is a critical stage for the patient. Um, precursor to rupture um, is gonna be that thinning. So if it thins, that is a precursor to rupture. Again, VSDs and other complications could occur. Uh, tethering effects. Um, start to, to appear. So what does tethering mean? Just like the pulling of the cordae. Okay. So yeah, the pulling on the cordae. So it's not necessarily a pulling of it itself. It just means that if I've got, um, I'm doing math, a string, right? So that string's kind of free floating. If it's tethered to it, that means that whatever this side does, there might be some stretch in that, but at some point it's gonna pull the other thing with it. That's tethering with it. So you're kind of tied to or linked to that other uh, side of things. So tethering, just think of it that way. So that could be a cord pulling on the leaflet of the valve. Uh, that could also mean that uh, if I'm looking at a short axis, for example, we have an anterior wall infarct, an aneurysm or scar, um, you're always looking for thickening and movement. Um, is that tissue that's dead, is it going to move or is it gonna stay still? What do you think? Are we talking about the affected wall or the component? compensation well so we'll say we'll say that the um we'll say that the anterior wall about mid portion is, is dead is no dead? so there's a distinction here so it's not going to thicken because muscle thickens as it squeezes but it is going to move because it's tethered to or linked to another wall segment Okay, so don't don't just follow the motion of the wall. You want to see is the wall actually thickening? That's really important, and that's that tethering effect is what we're talking about. Here. Okay, so I'm not going to go over this too much. We've kind of gone over uh, wall motion stuff. So again, regional is really important diagnostically. Uh, if we catch a a specific segment or a couple of segments of walls that are out. That is diagnostically CAD. Okay, we can diagnose that that patient has CAD. Um, if it's a global thing, again, globally, it can be C. Excuse me, it can be CAD because you might have triple vessel disease. They call it uh, extensive disease that affects the whole thing equally. Or um, if you just got one uh, coronary artery that goes out or a branch of it that goes out, you're just going to have the regional segment. Uh, other things, again, that can cause global uh, hypokinesis is things like infections, having a virus, um, myocarditis. Um, there's other things like that that can cause the heart to globally not work well. Um, and if it's equally working crappy, it's not diagnosing CAD. It could be something else in the differential still. Could it be CAD? Yes, but it's not always doing CAD if it's global. But if it's a regional segment, that is diagnostically CAD. Unless it's like a child and you know, we're dealing with one of those congenital abnormalities that happens to block out one of the coronary arteries, then that would also happen. Um, okay, so we've already, you already know the, the qualitative is that eyeball method. And again, eyeball method is something that you'll almost always see reported and you probably will report yourself. So you'll get, you know, as you look at these hearts and you're taking these uh, ejection fractions, you'll get an idea, you know, if it's between the 55 to 65 normal, if it's uh, like a 75 to 85 hyperkinetic, um, if it's hypokinetic, and you'll, you'll give a visual guesstimate of an ejection fraction. 
Um, that's very, very common to do. So that's the eyeball method. Um, remember that it's least uh, accurate, but some doctors actually prefer that over you know, quantified um, um, symptoms, for example. Uh, and that usually comes down to how much they trust the technologist that's doing the measurement accurately, not for short images of that. Uh, Semi-quantitative is that regional wall motion scoring and the index that we provide uh, by doing that. So that's again, taking each segment and assigning a one to five or one to seven uh, score and then, um, and then adding those just like we have in the past. Uh, and then other quantitative stuff are things like fractional shortening, which is done like the partially the long axis. That's when we're taking our M mode measurements uh, or two dimensional um, measurements that can do a fractional shortening. Uh, we have the radial shortening um, as well. So remember that uh, if we're doing like a short axis, for example, and we do this in strain imaging, uh, we look at not only the longitudinal motion, which is the motion from the apex towards the annulus, the back and forth, but in the short axis, you're also talking about thickening and how much it moves side to side uh, radially as well. Um, so those are other things that can be considered. Um, okay. And then other methods there, including Doppler methods, looking at uh, wall velocities, which is uh, tissue Doppler, um, myocardial displacement, um, strain, strain rate, et cetera. Okay. All right, so again, just to, to reemphasize global versus regional, um, you wanna look at more than one view. So you don't wanna determine everything based off of one view. Uh, we're looking for global ejection fraction. Um, again, as a screening tool, you will see a lot of people measure just the symptoms in the uh, apical four chamber view. Why do they only do that? Because it's, uh, it takes time to measure an EF. And you know, taking the extra time to do an extra view, um, is, uh, it just takes time. But if it's a normal heart, that's usually pretty acceptable. But if it's ever an abnormal heart, you definitely want your four chamber and two chamber. The sensors biplane is there for a reason because they get not only calculate a, an accurate volume, uh, but you also need to get an accurate ejection fraction. And if they've got wall segments that are out in a different plane, uh, you're not accurately representing what's happening. So the more of those you have, the better, but at least the, the biplane. The eyeball method is suggested is very, uh, subjective and uh, less accurate, even though you will see doctors that put more faith in that than they do the measured stuff. That's on them. Um, <clears throat> Simpson's biplane we measured to get volumes and areas. Um, normal thickening of the walls are gonna be between eight and 11 millimeters uh, to 14 to 16 millimeters. So that's gonna be, you know, taking all patients into consideration, small, small people versus big people, et cetera. Um, so we, we should see a decent amount of uh, thickening. How fast is the delay in contraction? Um, so that's going to be less than 50 milliseconds. Um, so that's from the EKG to when we actually see the wall thicken like an MO. You're not going to tell it from 2D, but in MO you can actually tell the timing of the EKG to uh, the physical motion. Yeah, Nancy? Do we measure that? How do we quantitate that? Um, I personally have never seen anybody measure that, but you certainly could. So you could go and put a caliper on where the EKG QRS is. So when you actually see contraction start on. on so how, how do you know that it has the number less than 50? Um, if you were to do this, they probably have more um, data in the lab to follow as far as how, exactly how to measure it. Again, I've never seen anybody actually do that measurement. Uh, that might be a new thing. Um, but an M mode is definitely where you do it on. Um, shape. So again, shape has to do with the remodeling idea. So you know, you know what a normal heart should look like, kind of that bullet shaped uh, structure. And uh, when the shape changes, um, that should be a clue that something is going on. Sometimes that's your first clue that something is wrong. Uh, and then we're going to try to distinguish things that are new versus things that are old. So on EKG, thinking way back to last fall, when we covered chapter 14 and with Darren, when we see changes in the EKG that suggest old stuff happening or scarring, 
what EKG wave do we look at in particular to tell us if there's an old um, infarct? The Q wave. Is it Q? Is a significant Q wave, meaning it's bigger and wider than it should be. So yes, that's exactly right. Uh, we're not necessarily going to see an ST segment elevation or inverted Q wave at that point because the uh, old scarred stuff is, is indicated by that significant Q wave. Good. What do you think it looks like an echo <clears throat> an old scarred area? Just super bright. Okay, so it will be bright because scarred tissue is brighter in the heart. So that's true. And the walls will be thin and they don't thicken. Okay, so those are your clues that you've got a scar. And you will see patients with scars. You'll be like, wow. I had a patient one time, she denied all, you know, all symptoms. She's like, no, never had any symptoms. And then you get short of breath. No, no, no. Uh, I'm like, well, do you run up a, you know, if you run up a set of stairs, do you get short of breath? She's like, nope, nope. And that's kind of my, my tell that uh, people are kind of lying to me or not admitting what's going on. Because anybody gets short of breath running up a set of stairs. I don't care who you are. You can be athletic, uh, it's just physiologic response. Uh, so when they do that, you know, you sort of take that with a grain of salt. But when I scanned her, I think she was like, like at a, no joke, she was like a 15 to 20% EF. The entire anterior wall was out um, as well as part of the lateral wall. The only thing that was really functioning sort of was the posterior wall. It was crazy. It was like, how could you not be symptomatic, right? So My grandma was, does that. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. lies and lies and lies, even though we know you're not it's okay. Wild. Yeah, and, and part of that's just their own sanity. Uh, when you think that you've got heart issues going on, people when people think of heart stuff, they think of dying and they think of heart attacks, and they don't want to be that person that has a heart attack. So they will deny their symptoms, you know. And unfortunately, that ends up in something like a heart attack. So seeing it early on and being admitted. Uh, of that, and, and again, I, I admit for myself, I am I'm that person. I am the last one to go to medical care when I need it. Um, I'm not stupid about it necessarily, but it's a big risk for me not to go in. Okay, the same thing with these patients. Uh, so it doesn't help us really to deny what's going on, uh, except that we don't have to go through extra procedures and tests. Um, okay, so shape. So these are just some ideas of different shapes. So take note of the normal. So we've got our normal shape here, kind of bullet shape, uh, you know, symmetrically parabolic uh, in, a, in a short axis, nice and round. So we, again, the roundness can have to do with uh, placement of transducer. If you're too low, it's going to be oblong in a vertical way. If you're too twisted and you're not uh, quite twisted accurately, it's going to be oblong left to right. Okay, that's in a normal heart. Um, you can have uh, wall segments that are out and you can have that oblong wide shape, okay? But that's maybe because the wall is infarcted and uh, you have hypokinesis or aneurysmal stuff going on that's causing that shape. So you're gonna get round when it's a normal heart, but not necessarily on the other. So that's where it's important to be able to know that you're lined up accurately or twisted accurately um, you know, displaying the capillary muscles evenly, that kind of thing. Uh, you don't want one capillary muscle, for example, free floating and the other one attached to the wall. Um, on the aneurysmal one uh, down below, so again, it kind of uh, pouches out. Now here it's showing uh, aneurysm at the apex. Okay, again, it doesn't have to be the apex. An aneurysm is just a distinct dilation of an area, um, almost with a... Um, an area of normal and then it goes beyond normal okay so that's a reshaping at the aneurysm this is very common um and you think about that it makes sense because the anterior descending coronary artery is the furthest one down the track uh, if there's any obstruction happening it's likely to affect the apex okay there is a little bit of blood uh, flow overlap in that area but uh, that's that's a significant place to hit if there's a, a blockage earlier it's going to likely affect that and a segment higher up on the anterior wall in particular. Uh, the short axis of that, you might have um, some dilation here. So it's kind of uh, showing anterior, almost anterior septal wall. It would be nice if they drew in the right ventricle because I think that's anterior and anterior septal wall that it's uh, showing. Um, and then again, regional dilation. So it could be just one small section that's dilated, okay? And uh, it's important to be able to distinguish that. 
Uh, again, regional stuff on the lateral wall here. That's regional close to the septum. And then the ones that are more subtle and actually more difficult to catch are the ones at the base. Okay, because when you see it at the base, we don't really think about it that much. It's a gradual taper. It's not necessarily a bulge, okay? And it's also an area that's hard to see because there's often artifacts from, um, from lungs and things around it. So they, they can be subtle. And your clue on those is, is paying attention to your, your measurements of the chamber size, okay? So if you pay attention to those, you'll, you'll catch some of these a little bit more easily because that's, that's a subtle one and that's a hard one to catch. Okay, not going to run through the nomenclature. There's a difference between the 17 segment and the old nomenclature that they use. Okay, these guys are 17 segments is where we're at. Okay, and again, we had this discussion earlier, but uh, last quarter at least, but um, just the wall motion scoring. So this chart added in a few more details and, and that is uh, repeated in the new version of the text. Um, so we have our normal as one. Um, and some labs are going to use this, not all labs will do this. Uh, but a score of zero indicates hyperdynamic, meaning it's squeezing harder and faster and thicker than, than it does at normal, at rest. Uh, and again, some people subcategorize to a mildly hypokinetic, giving it a score of one and a half. Uh, and again, severely hypokinetic of two and a half. Uh, and then they additionally put in a kinetic with a scar and dyskinetic with a scar for scores six and seven. Okay. Uh, most labs are going to use this uh, on the left here as, as your cutoff. I'm kind of one of these people. I, and you'll see this a lot uh, when you're scoring, for example, or, or quantifying how big a regurgitation is, for example. Uh, people never seem to want to be decisive and make a decision on it. They'll just say, it's mildly moderate or, or moderately severe or comments like this. In this case, mildly hypokinetic, severely hypokinetic. Um, so you're sort of splitting hairs between hypokinesis and akinesis, okay? Severely hypokinetic, I kind of get. Uh, mildly hypokinetic, eh, I don't know. If I'm giving it a score, it's either gonna be a one or a two. That's just for me. And that depends on the lab that you work in. Okay, so the role of 3D, um, what's nice, so what, what do you think the major issue is with 3D um, looking at these wall segments? Is 3D better, do you think, or worse than 2D? Okay. Theoretically, it gives us a better overall representation, and from a mathematical standpoint, it gives us more accurate volume calculation. What's the pitfall of uh, 3D? What's the weakness of it? Same rate. Okay, frame, frame rate or volume rate is definitely a big part of that, yes. Uh, what about detail resolution? When you're seeing a 3D rendering, how, uh, how detailed are the pixels that you see on that relative to your 2D pixels? It's actually a voxel compared to a pixel. Do they seem to be very sharp, very detailed, or kind of blurry? It's blurry in comparison, right? Yeah, they're often blurry. So the processing, in addition to the motion artifacts and stuff like that, they don't have the aesthetic uh, appeal that the 2D image has um, on the good stuff. So there's a discrepancy there. And then the other thing is, is getting a good 2D slice can be difficult. I mean, you experience how difficult it is to get a 2D slice without artifact in it. So now imagine getting in the elevational plane all the slices without artifacts if you had put the 3D together. Okay, so that's the complication of 3D is that it's influenced so much by artifacts, you know, so you might have one good 2D slice and you might have 10, two, 10 really good 2D slices through that sector. Um, but if the majority of those are poor, you're going to have a poor uh, outcome. So 3D is great. It gives us a good mathematical representation, way more accurate, but um, it has issues with that. The cool thing about 3D is that when you have it beating and you have it live, you notice how this actually displays uh, on the volume part of this, it shows these segments. Okay, those are each of the regional wall segments displayed here. Okay, so it can give you a more accurate representation regionally um, of the regional wall motion abnormalities and ejection fraction, um, as well as an overall global ejection fraction as well. And it might pick up subtle differences of uh, abnormalities where there might be an aneurysm or hypokinesis. Something like that. 
So those uh, technologies are quite good. Uh, again, it's it's all relative to how good your input into it is. Okay, DTI and speckle. <clears throat> again, this kind of goes along uh, the next step from the diastolic function stuff. So um, if we were to employ that on these images, then the cool thing about this technology is you can take your pictures and I can take my stress echo clips and I can apply these algorithms to those stress echo clips after the fact. It doesn't have to be done live. Uh, so they could actually take these to, to get further data out of what they're seeing. And it might give more subtle um, quantitative type of uh, speckle tracking data uh, that you might not even see with your eye very well. But when you put it in a graphical form, you might start to catch it. Okay, and in here, they're, what they're showing on this picture down here is they're showing an anterior septum versus the posterior wall. Uh, and you can see that the anterior septum is peaking here where the posterior wall is peaking here. So you see there's a difference in the timing of contraction. Uh, between the wall segments. And that's done again by speckle tracking and spraying imaging. All right, other methods for uh, detecting ischemia. So they're perfluorocarbon or nitrogen based microbubbles. Uh, so this is your Definity or Lumison or one of the other manufacturers. Uh, that's the LVO, the left ventricular opacification method. Um, new product, uh, the Lumison is uh, sulfur hexafluoride lipid uh, type A microsphere. It's a microbubble. It's tiny, goes through the lungs, goes through the left and right heart equally. Uh, and it does uh, have a, a short uh, half-life, so they, they tend to, they probably last about the same amount of time in the body. Um, but again, these, these contrast and, and or echo enhancement agents are quite helpful in detecting wall segment abnormalities. Uh, so again, if you don't see at least two wall segments um, and can't quantify them, you should be using your contrast instrument then. The cool thing real quick about Lumison, you don't have to refrigerate it. Uh, it comes in a pre-packaged uh, thing that's uh, kind of sealed like your, uh, you haven't done the surgical asepsis yet, but you got those packages that are kind of sealed and then you open it up and it's all fresh and then you got to use it. Um, <clears throat> that's how that is. So you can actually, you can take it from your lab, you can throw it on your cart uh, or on your ultrasound system if you go up to a room to scan and if you need it, you can open it and activate it at that time. Uh, whereas Definity, you have to keep refrigerated and the little vials uh, you have to take and they are put in a special shaker and it shakes it real fast for about a minute uh, to activate it. Uh, and then once that's activated, you have to use it um, through the day, basically. So there's just some subtle differences between them. Okay, clinical syndrome. So uh, angina pectoris. So consider the timing of the resting echo and other possible causes of angina. So in other words, we're talking about chest pain. So as you're looking what you see on the echo, does it correlate to what uh, that pain symptoms and stuff are that the patient has? So let's just for a minute talk about the symptoms that a patient might experience. What do you think they would uh, present to you as? What is the usual type of pain that they experience? Well, Go ahead, Kelsey. Well, I was just going to say, you said it, uh, chest pain and then shortness of breath. Okay. Shoulder, pain, pain in the shoulder, pain in the stomach. Matt, women usually have a pain in the stomach. Yeah, I was going to say, are we talking usual men or usual women? <laughs> well, usual for people generally is the classic left uh, upper quadrant. Um, but with women, there is an atypical chest pain uh, that you certainly cannot discard. Um, but most women still do have the typical chest pain, but there will be some women, a, a large percentage of women that actually do have that atypical chest pain. Um, jaw pain. Jaw pain, yes. So that's the thing with it could be right sided, it could be left sided, it could be epigastric, okay? There could just be just, just a weird feeling other people have. So you won't, don't want to necessarily discount it, but we do want to rule out uh, cardiac causes of things. Uh, so we're just still going to pay attention to it, even though we may not think it may be related. Uh, for example, if somebody has just uh, got back from the gym the night before, they had a really hard workout, um, they may have had some sharp pain, okay, it may be, it may be kind of superficial in a particular chest location, maybe they're doing um, bench press, okay, that could be a heart attack. 
or it could be muscle damage or muscle strain. Okay, so there are things like that that it, it might be something else, but we definitely want to rule out and do a good proper echo so that we can tell um, what's going on. Uh, but classically, um, pain will be described. So when I, when I mean what type of pain is it, so chest pain generally is, is good, but you also, as an echo tech, you want to narrow that down even more and say, describe the pain for me. So they will describe it either as a shooting pain, uh, it could be a sharp pain, it could be a dull pain, uh, just something that's just persistently there, doesn't really go away, there could be a pressure, okay? And what I always ask the patient as well, is there anything that makes that pain go away? Okay, so like claudication in the leg, if the patient is experiencing leg pain, and their answer to what makes the pain go away is getting up and walking or running, it ain't arterial disease, right? So same thing with the heart is we're kind of considering these things, uh, the type of pain that they can describe it to you is important as well as what makes it go away. If uh, sitting and resting makes it go away, that does suggest that there's some blood supply issues, okay? Uh, classically, uh, patients, and you'll get to experience this as you're in the cardiac world, that a lot of patients that have had heart attacks would describe it as a pressure. Uh, or that their chest is tight, or that there's an elephant sitting on their chest type of a, of a pain. It's not usually a sharp pain. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't be, okay? Uh, but sharp pains and things like that, they often end up being some type of a neurologic pain, or uh, it could be something like a pericarditis, which has a different presentation. It's still chest pain, but it's a different type of chest pain. And uh, those dull, pressure type of pains are the ones that are usually suggestive. And most patients that I, I've experienced that have had a heart attack have more of that type of pain. Okay, but again, don't discount the other ones. We're still gonna image and see what we see. All right, acute MI. So, um, so echo is good at determining the location, uh, the extent of it, and uh, the prognosis. So again, the prognosis is determining what's the uh, likelihood of recovery after the fact. Um, again, location and extent of it. So what do I mean by extent of the, uh, of that process in the MI? How many, how many walls? walls? Yeah. How many wall segments exactly? Yeah. So we want to quantify every one of them. Uh, what do you think you would pay attention to on a follow-up study, say two weeks from now? If we, if we saw something today and we saw it in the basal anterior wall, uh, maybe into the maybe into the mid. So we'll say it's anterior, basal, and mid section. What do you think we'd want to pay attention to? And say that was scarred. Say that became dead tissue. Two or three weeks from now, what do we want to pay attention to? If there's any other walls involved. Yes, absolutely. So that means that the extent of the disease process is going more. It's it's increasing. We don't want it to increase. Okay. Uh, often we can't save tissue that's permanently damaged. Well, we can't save tissue that's permanently damaged already. Although there are stem cell research stuff being done that you can actually regrow tissue. But generally speaking, uh, a dead tissue is not gonna go any farther, but because you already had issues in that location, um, it could progress beyond that. We wanna, we wanna stop that progression. Uh, they'll probably be aggressive on lipid therapies and things like that and, and cholesterols and making sure that all their numbers are in good, in good order so that we don't get a repeat uh, event happening. Um, but it is common for things to progress and, and, and get worse. So pay attention to that. Um, okay, so regional wall motion uh, abnormalities can be seen without the EKG evidence. So remember that's further down the, the path in the east ischemic cascade. Uh, so we want to pay attention to uh, things that we see, even if it's not confirmed by EKG per se. Uh, there will be variable degrees in thinning and scarring, depending on number one, how old the infarct is um, or how extensive it is. And uh, seeing it might also depend on how good your windows are to see the tissue. Uh, if we constantly get shadowed out and we just can't see very well, that might not be quite as evident. Uh, then there's other things that could happen. So we're looking at wall segments. We're looking at timing of contractions and things like this. So there are things like bundle branch blocks that can cause uh, kind of a funky bounce to the septum. 
Um, but again, what to pay attention to is the thickening of that wall itself uh, throughout, no matter what the timing is. Uh, sometimes that patient needs to get a pacemaker or something to get that timing aligned properly. Uh, in M mode with a bundle branch, we could get an early, what they call a, a beat or a downward uh, little blip. Here is that there. So in this uh, EKG, so you can see that we're in diastole here. This is the end of diastole right here. Uh, you get this <clears throat> bit of an early blip comes down here, and then you get the actual squeeze here. Um, this is interesting. As I'm correlating the EKG to this, though, this is actually quite a distance from the QRS complex to when systole actually happens. So systole actually begins right here. Okay. It isn't super far after, but it's it seems like it's uh, and maybe it's just because the scoop speed is increased, but um, you'll see the thickening here. So we're looking at this thickening here. We have the thickening right here on that muscle, even though these happen at different timings. Uh, kind of the peak of the septal thickening is, is happening about right there. But you get these little funky beats and stuff that happen early. Uh, those are evidence of uh, things like bundle branch block. Kelsey? Um, this is kind of just more for Ella. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ella, but don't you have that little blip there in, when we were looking at M mode with um, Tammy? I think so, but I also have a right bundle branch block. Is it for any bundle branch block then? Well, it can be because if you get the, the left is more dominant because there's more left tissue on the septum uh, compared to the right, but you certainly can have that because there's something early in the block and it depends on where it's happening in the bundle branch. If it's closer to the bundle of his uh, as opposed to further down in the apex, uh, it will be more evident. But yeah, you can certainly have something from either right or left. Nancy? So how would you measure that? You wouldn't go in a straight line, would you? Um, and that depends because as you've seen some ultra stem systems, you can't go off that straight line. Right. So what you might do is, is take it as best you can. If it's me, I'm probably going to take it off my diastolic one or my posterior wall at the back because I think that's a good consistent one. And then I, I'm going to take the measurement as it passes through, but then I might add an extra caliper right here to show what that thickness is. For that thick guy there, yeah. Okay. So the doctors will understand when you know the system doesn't let you uh, vary where you're taking that location. Out. Some systems do, some don't. Can you swap that that data point then in the yeah. report once or, it's called IVSS? I probably wouldn't because they're not gonna if they know that they've got like a bundle branch, they're gonna put uh, they're not gonna concern about that that much. And the fact is. Most labs actually don't measure the contraction uh, thickness either. So usually we're doing a diastolic measurement, which is applicable here, but most labs don't do the septal thickening uh, or systolic thickening. They just, they just don't. So two part is most labs just don't do it, period. And the other part is if they know they've got something like that, they're not that concerned about it. There's other data to prove what they got out. Yeah, it oh, hey, Nancy, didn't Tammy say that? Go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, didn't Tammy say that Ella's blip had to do with the right ventricle volume overload and not a bundle branch block? It's yeah, still, right. still going to affect probably the. It's kind uh, of the same. It's still going to affect the conduction. So it wouldn't surprise me. But, but yes, I mean, if it's a big pressure thing, that could be pushing the septum in the direction as well. So what's the difference uh, physiologically? What do you think the difference is between being pushed by a ventricle pressure overload as opposed to a, an electrical conduction thing? Since we're talking about the difference between them. If you're really to look at it, most techs don't get into that detail, but if we were to really look at it, what do you think would be the difference? The timing of when it happens. Uh, the timing could be the same. It could happen early. The pressure increases and starts to flatten the septum. Okay, so that could be part of it. But if I'm just pushing on something pressure-wise, okay, it's taking my wall and it's moving it, right? So I see the movement. What happens? What's the difference between being pushed and moved as opposed to an electrical conduction? What 
is the electrical conduction doing to the muscle tissue? Stimulating it for thickening. Okay. So then you might see a thickening difference as well. If it's just being pushed, it's not going to thicken differently. If it's being uh, an electrical signal passing through it, then it's likely that it's going to start contracting as well. So you'll start to see some thickening. Again, nobody looked at it in that kind of detail. They just noticed those. Uh, it doesn't look quite normal. It doesn't have this, the uh, septal and the posterior wall coming in at the same time. Uh, that's mostly what we're going to pay attention to. Okay, so left bundle branch uh, versus ischemia and regional wall motion abnormality. So this just kind of goes over some of the differences that you're going to see. So really, we want to pay attention to thickening. Uh, we want to look at the locations. The timing does um, have an effect on it. I'm not going to make you memorize this chart. It's just FYI stuff. Uh, the geometry again, so um, it's common to have uh, abnormal geometry or shaping of the ventricle uh, with ischemia, whereas the left bundle branch, you're not going to have a different shape necessarily. Uh, and then it's throwing right ventricular pacing in this here, the last section, by the way. Um, temporal uh, dyssynchrony, so dyssynchrony is uh, the timing of things are off. Okay. So hey, we don't even have this chart in our book. Is that not in the new one? Yeah, this is just information on that. You might not have to memorize this at all. It's not going to be on the test. But it is nice just to kind of show the differences that you might see between uh, those things to determine if it's a left bundle branch or ischemia. Uh, the biggest thing with ischemia is always look at the thickening. Okay, <clears throat> so cabbage. So the cabbage is usually a treatment option after somebody's had a heart attack. What is a cabbage? Not the vegetable. Coronary artery bypass graft. Yes, good. I'm assuming that was off the top of your head and you just weren't reading it, right? Just kidding. It actually was off the top of my head. I didn't even yeah, have awesome. to read it. <laughs> so it's a bypass graft. So it's a treatment option, but do you ever get patients that have had a cabbage done to come see you and, and now they've got something going on and they happen to have already had a cabbage. Yes. So people that have had uh, heart attacks in the past and procedures to fix them um, or to repair what we can or reperfuse, um, they're likely to come back with, for, with uh, future events. Okay. So um, just respect it. So what you do want to know for the bypass graft is where the graft was placed so we know what uh, tissue it was reperfusing. Uh, it'd be extremely helpful to know if there had been any previous damage, okay, to know where you might see scarring and stuff like that. So as you're doing the resting echo, you're kind of paying attention to that territory. Um, and then looking to see if it's extended beyond uh, what it originally had. Um, <clears throat> Abnormal septal motion. So as Tammy had mentioned, uh, you can have uh, abnormal septal motion, at least occurring on the M mode, um, because of pressure overload issues, but also surgeries. So if you've had surgeries, um, or even just congenital defects uh, can cause abnormalities of uh, the electrical system conduction and cause uh, weird septal motion. But it's very common after a surgery, for quite a while after surgery, that uh, they have this funny little bounce to the septum when it's, when it's uh, beating. All right, so ischemia, and greater than 25% results in akinesis or dyskinesis of the entire wall. Um, so again, it's not necessarily going to be just one small spot. You want to pay attention to that whole, that whole anterior wall, that whole lateral wall, for example. Yeah, Nancy? Is this whole slide cabbage related? Uh, no. Um, it, well, not entirely, no. Because I can't find cabbage in this chapter either. OK. They don't have cabbage in there? Uh, I searched cabbage, and it's only in the stress, it's chapter 16 stress echo. Probably shifted some information around. Okay. Uh, we'll say that this is cabbage related. Oh, this whole slide. Okay. 
the, the ultra sensitive troponin assays, I mean, they will apply to cabbage, but they'll also apply to all heart attacks. So that one's not necessarily just cabbage related. Uh, and just knowing that strain and spray strain rate are more sensitive. And again, those things can be applied after uh, you finish the test. It's not like you have to do it like during a stress test or something. You can take clips after the fact. You can even take them off the ultrasound system and perform them on software that might be on your uh, offline computer. Uh, some of that is uh, technology. All right, so natural history. So after an MI, there will be changes that are relative uh, to how long the occlusion uh, and reperfusion occurred. So this is that uh, idea of the door to balloon time and all that stuff is you know, the length of time that you not have blood supply will be a greater effect on uh, the actual physical signs that we see in the heart. So we know it takes about six weeks to go from necrosis to scarring. Okay, during that six weeks is when remodeling happens. That's when it starts to shape and uh, change, change uh, the dimensions in geometry. Uh, adverse remodeling can, uh, can be minimized with proper treatment. So again, I put adverse or negative remodeling because that's, you know, that's suggesting that it's getting worse. Okay, whereas a positive type of remodeling uh, would suggest that with our treatment of like pacemakers and stuff, we can rebuild and re-strengthen uh, muscle tissue beyond that stenosis um, and bring it back to some degree. So it can be actually quite dilated. And then if we treat it properly, it can actually start to become more normalized, even though it will never be totally normal. Uh, the adverse remodeling, uh, the worst prognosis due to if there's other developments and stuff. So if there's other things become involved and say we got a torn capillary muscle and things like that, uh, those things are obviously gonna make the, uh, the situation even worse than it already is. So with echo, with generally speaking, the regional wall motion abnormalities, the key on this is definitely to see the endocardial surface. Um, and then to be able to calculate the systolic and the diastolic volumes uh, via the EF that we take off the symptoms biplane. So take home message for that. And it's okay to, uh, to zoom up, uh, or I shouldn't say to zoom up, I should say to optimize your image uh, with your depth and sector size to get the, the ventricle being the focus of your um, picture. Uh, I was talking to Tyler yesterday and uh, we were just comment, he was commenting about some, sometimes people are zooming too much on things. Uh, just remember when you zoom up significantly and you start to cut off other um, anatomical structures around what you're looking at, uh, sometimes you lose the perspective of what's going on. So always zoom enough to see your structure but with a little bit extra around it so that you can see the anatomical reference of, you know, see if you're in the proper view, uh, rotation, stuff like that. So likewise, um, <clears throat> you want to you want to optimize for the ventricle. Uh, usually I cut off my depth about halfway through the atria for these views uh, for taking symptoms. Um, all of my other echo views go past the uh, the top of the um, the atria, which is deep in the image. Uh, but seeing that endocardial surface is important. So this is where your breathing techniques and stuff become vital uh, to what you're seeing and making sure that you can actually see the endocardium. What, what should you do if you don't see your endocardium well? What can you do on the system, do you think, to see the endocardium better? You're scanning, you're struggling seeing all the walls. What can you do? Dynamic range. Okay. Harmonics. Okay. Uh, are we talking about enhancing agents? We'll pretend we're in our lab. We don't have enhancing agents here. So yeah, those are a couple of settings. What other settings could you try? Possibly gray maps. Maps, good. Anything else? The focus. Focal position, that's important. Possibly gaining up a little bit. Gain. Okay. So are those items, first of all, are they going to fix a poor window? No. 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 If you've got a poor window, you can tweak things a little bit, but it's not going to significantly help anything. Uh, let me just take a couple of things and let's just say 
tell me what the difference would be between using dynamic range and gray maps for looking at the endocardium. What would you expect to happen if you use either one of those? So we'll start with dynamic range. What would you expect if you go up or down in dynamic range, first of all? You'll have more pronounced uh, grays or not pronounced grays. Which direction? If you go up, it gets smoother. Yeah. So you, you have, go down, it gets more black and white. Yeah. So the contrast is really what we're looking at. And so if we go up, we're increasing the number of shades of gray that are available. If we drop it, we're decreasing the number of shades of gray available, which makes a greater separation and therefore a greater contrast between two objects. Um, okay, leave that one for a second and talk about maps. Tell me about the maps. What do they do? Makes it easier for the eye to see if it's a different color of B mode. Different color in a colorized B mode or grayscale B mode? Grayscale B mode. Okay, so there are colorized maps and you can certainly use that. Um, so say that statement again. Um, just making the grayscale a different color so it's easier for the eye to see. Okay, so what what is a compression map doing? So it does make a different map to display things differently so you, so you do have that different contrast, yes. But what is it actually doing? What is it doing to your dynamic range? I'll put it that way. Increasing it. Stays the same. So the point is, I'm personally a bigger proponent of using gray maps than I am dynamic range, and this is the reason. Uh, if I drop my dynamic range, like you said, um, we eliminate shades of gray. Okay, so I have fewer to choose from. Uh, if I use a different compression map, it's just rearranging the number of shades of gray that I have available in different patterns. One pattern might be higher contrast, one might be a more subtle contrast. Um, so you want to still see your soft tissues of the muscle and things like that, but you still want your fluids to be near black. Okay, they should be anechoic, you know, ideally. Uh, but we don't want to, so here's, here's an example. So if I drop my dynamic range too low, I might lose the detail of my structures like, um, like my chordae tendinae. I might not see them. Okay, so those subtle structures are what I personally use to see if I've eliminated too much information because you can't re-put back information that you eliminated. Um, just like when you use a reject, if it rejects those low-level echoes, you're not going to be able to bring them back with a map you can change it and you can just change the display pattern while maintaining a high level uh, of number of shades of gray. So personally, I would prefer to use maps for that reason and the fact that it can be done post-processing. Um, some of the newer systems, you can do dynamic range after you freeze, but um, all systems, you can use maps um, before or after. Okay. Does this include like a larger individual as well? Yes. Because if, if I'm imaging, generally speaking, whatever I'm imaging, do you want to use a higher or lower frequency generally? If you have the choice on an object that you're looking at, would you rather look at a pixel from a high frequency or a lower frequency? High frequency so that we can see detail. Right. So we want the best detail, provided we can penetrate, yes. And that's where your harmonics and things like that come in. So we want the highest resolution that we can. Uh, we also want the most information there from the, the shades of gray. So rearranging the shades of gray rather than eliminating shades of gray, I think is a better option. Okay. So I think it just gives us more data that the system can deal with. Uh, if we eliminate it, it's just gone. And maybe that accomplishes our purpose for that, but um, I think a better solution personally is a map change. Um, so the point is, is you can't improve an image that inherently is uh, bad because of artifacts or things in your way. So in other words, uh, you know, again, 90% of your image detail comes from the window that you get. Beyond that, we can smooth, we can tweak it, we can make it look pretty, 
you know, softer, we can make it look more contrasted. You can do all sorts of things with it that way after you get a good picture. But if you don't have the good picture to start with, you don't have very much to work with, okay? So window, window, window. Um, okay, so if you don't have any way to show me the endocardium uh, after you've gotten your good window or the best window you can, and you tweak your uh, image parameters as much as you can, what then can you do beyond that? LVO. And then you can use the LVO types of contrast. Yes, so like your definities and your understands and that type of thing, so yes. And again, if you don't see at least two wall segments, uh, regional wall segments, you need to uh, use contrast. That's, that's highly suggested and recommended. Good. Okay, so prognosis, uh, generally the more globally involved or the more segments that are involved, the worse your likelihood is of a good outcome, okay? And the greater likelihood of congestive heart failure, uh, arrhythmias and death, okay? So bad, bad, bad. Bad, badder and worse, I don't know. Uh, important echo parameters then, so we wanna see the extent of the regional wall segment. So in any way that you can demonstrate that is good. Uh, via your clips, uh, and again, using echo enhancing agents if you've got them available. Um, looking at global ventricular dysfunction, um, end diastolic and end systolic volume indexes and EFs, uh, short and long-term uh, prognosis can be uh, determined. Um, and again, you're gonna be doing follow-ups and stuff like this to, uh, to see how that, that changes your theory. Uh, we should also see uh, compensatory hyperkinesis in, uh, in other segments, usually segments across from the one that you're looking at. Um, if, if you don't see that, uh, you might have multi-vessel disease. In other words, uh, the other coronary arteries are also involved. And so what do I mean by uh, compensatory hyperkinesis? Give me an example of that. Like extra? An extra oh. thickening or working of the muscle? Yes, so compensatory suggests it's compensating for the one that's weak. Okay, so it's, it's not only our regular amount of squeeze extra, but it's actually squeezing even more uh, than the other walls would be perhaps uh, to compensate for what the weak wall is not doing. Uh, again, suggesting that if that's the case, then you might have uh, disease in, in the other vessels if they're not responding uh, in that fashion. So compensatory hyperkinesis, you expect if I'm looking at uh, two chamber view, for example, and I've got my anterior wall is uh, akinetic or hypokinetic, I would expect, and it's, you usually see this more if it's an akinetic wall, but if my anterior wall is akinetic, my inferior wall I would expect to be really squeezing hard. And if I were to go into short axis, I might see the other walls um, um, a little bit more as well, but that inferior wall might be even more so than that one. And from a basal perspective, you know, what's happening at the base, the opposite wall of, at the base is going to be squeezing more. The one down at the apex doesn't necessarily squeeze more. Um, so it kind of becomes, so it's kind of a wall opposite of what you're uh, looking at that uh, compensates. Nancy, do you have a comment? Okay. Just taking notes. Good, good. All right. So Doppler evaluation and acute uh, MI. So we can look, so again, we're gonna focus first absolutely on, especially if you're doing a stress test, presumably that's what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna focus on uh, the wall motion first and then we're gonna go to the, to the Doppler stuff because uh, it tends to have a little bit longer effect. Uh, so the LV outflow in VPI is good to track the success of recovery. So that's, uh, remember, uh, tracing of the outflow tract is giving us a good, uh, overall sample of what our stroke volume is like and the amount of volume actually passing through the heart. Uh, so that can give us a good idea. So if it's a really weak or, or shallow or a low velocity type of VPI or a short VPI, um, that's an indication that it's not going so well as it becomes bigger then it becomes more volume going through it, which is good. Um, you can assess the global function and regional wall motions. Um, those can be uh, more clinically relevant. So we're always gonna uh, reevaluate after somebody's had a heart attack. Uh, we're always gonna go back and look at wall segments and doing you know, global and regional uh, evaluation. 
uh, post MI results uh, in reduced mitral EMA um, and prolonged deceleration time. So uh, again, it would be no surprise that uh, if my heart is now not functioning good and systole, it probably has diastolic issues as well. Uh, meaning that the, you know, and there's less volume going through. So my ease and age might be overall it's just reducing velocity. Uh, but again, that, uh, that prolonged deceleration time, but just like now, uh, we don't have that really nice recoil and, and relaxation that we normally would have had. There's more damage to the tissue and issues going on that way, causing diastolic dysfunction. All right, color um, can determine new leaks. So we don't, if somebody's had a heart attack and maybe you notice that uh, they've got some breathing issues still, I mean, some of that just may be explained because the heart's not functioning that well, but uh, especially in the, in the close time frame of when that heart attack happened, we do want to pay attention to a couple things on the wall. So yes, we could tear off the papillary muscle, okay, but we could also rupture through a wall because of that, uh, that weakening wall. Um, and so we might get a VSD, for example. So we want to put color on the septum. And we want to look at the entire septum, not just one slice of it. Okay. And we're looking for leaks going between usually the LV and the RV from the LV to the RV, but it could go the other way around too. Not only that, you also want to pay attention to the free wall of the LV because just like we can get a, a hole in the septal wall, you can get a hole that leaks outside the heart into the pericardium as well. Uh, so those are things that we do want to pay attention to. Uh, pericardial effusions, uh, about 30 to 40 percent of the time, um, might have ST elevation um, in transient small effusions. So now we're looking for little fluid collections around the heart. Uh, just the amount of trauma alone that happens during a heart attack that can cause fluid buildup inside the pericardium. Um, but again, we also want to pay attention to possible leaks uh, because of wall damage. Um, the cause of these small ones can be epicardial inflammation. So again, just the trauma that the heart goes through, that inflammation process can uh, cause uh, more fluid production uh, in that area. Large effusions, you should suspect a rupture, especially if you see blood inside the, um, inside the pericardial space. Uh, Dresler syndrome, so that is recurrent pain with fluid uh, from six weeks to three months post MI. So they might be having some of those recurrent pain symptoms. And when you do the echo, uh, you're finding pericardial effusion and symptoms. Uh, the worst is impending or partial rupture of the ventricular wall, um, recurring chest pain, dynamic EKG, and no enzyme increase. Uh, the enzyme increase suggests that there's actually a heart attack happening and uh, it's, it's muscle damage. Um, if that's not currently happening, uh, you're not going to have these enzymes in here. Is it, so, excuse me, Scott, is it still about the Dressler syndrome worsening is in? Uh, no, Dressler syndrome is kind of that recurrent pain fluid from six weeks to three months. I mean, obviously it can get worse than that, but I guess I kind of go with that. He's going with the chest pain and that uh, with the fluid collection. So yeah, kind of. I don't test on that. Um, so this is an example of a pericardial fusion. So you can see this is a decent sized one. So um, this is the area around the heart, okay? This is all pericardial fusion. Uh, this is a hemorrhagic one. So fluid as it starts, blood as it starts to clot up, you'll see that it kind of forms and starts to thrombose. That's what's happening in here. So you've got this fluid collection that's thrombosing inside that space. Uh, a normal pericardial fusion is going to be clear fluid. Okay, it's going to be black. Okay, just like your uh, blood pool would be, but it's, it doesn't have blood cells and stuff in it. It should just be serous type of fluid. Just because we're working on like identifying TEE images, like where exactly is this TEE taken from? So this one, so this, so we are close to um, the ventricle is where our first chamber is. So this has to be down lower into the, either the low esophagus or into the stomach itself. It's probably into the antrum of the stomach if you uh, 
transducer is flexed so that it's touching the anterior stomach wall and, uh, and underneath the heart. So it's coming underneath the heart there. Uh, we don't see left atria. If it's a high position, we're going to see the atria and the, the base of the heart and then the ventricles below that. So the first thing we're seeing here is the ventricles. So we're down probably in the center. There's a plax view of a pericardial effusion on page 441. Is it the new book? Yes, the new book. And we'll get a little bit more into some of the effusions in, uh, in another chapter. Uh, we'll get more detail about it. This is just uh, talking about heart attack stuff here. So what we're really looking for is small, uh, clear fluid collections or ones with hemorrhagic. The hemorrhagic ones are definitely a concern because that means that there's probably a leak in the wall. Uh, they've got arrows and stuff pointing to the wall segment that looks like it's out uh, in this case. Uh, if you were to stick color Doppler on that, we might see a little shunt flowing from inside the heart uh, leaking out into that space. Okay, so thinning, so scarring, um, infarction, and uh, acute remodeling. So we, we get the thinning uh, happens within that seven, uh, 24 to 72 hours immediately, uh, or fairly soon after the heart attack happens. Uh, if it's a transmural one, meaning it's a full thickness um, heart attack. Those, uh, those um, not the semi, uh, the other one. Um, anyway, the, uh, the subacute ones, the ones that are just underneath the endocardial layer, they're probably not likely to tear all the way through. It's these ones that are full thickness uh, MIs that uh, do this. Uh, they're more uh, common anteroapically, so the anterior wall and the apical area, which happens to be one of the hardest areas to see and demonstrate very well on ultrasound, uh, just because of our windows. Uh, echo can detect the bulging without scarring. Uh, maybe three to five millimeters thick uh, rather than eight to 10 millimeters thick. Um, and technically anything less than six millimeters is considered thin. So if you're thinking a wall looks like it's thin, uh, measured in diastole, first of all, but um, if it's less than six millimeters, uh, you're talking about a thin wall. Uh, if you need to quantify that. Um, in a hospital, uh, mortality rate of about 40% in these patients. So we don't want to miss them. So, okay. Scott, I have a question. Could you please uh, clarify if it's when we're talking uh, about a wall, if getting thicken, thickening, when it's transient attack? So, uh, thinning occurred 24 72 hours. Is that thickening a cure too when is is ischemia? So these uh, so the 70, 24 to 72 hours. So it, in diastole, the wall doesn't thicken. Uh, it just it just thins. So this uh, three to five millimeters thick just talks about it, it's actually thin. I don't know if that word is throwing you off there or not. Normally our walls about eight to ten millimeters thick, and if it's uh, three to five millimeters thick, that says it's thinner than it should be. It, it shouldn't thicken. Okay, thank you. I mean, theoretically, if the wall is inflamed, then maybe it does a little bit, but um, we should have a thinning instead of a thickening. And we're talking about diastole only. Don't look at it in systole because you might pull out the thickening just because of the. the Okay, so in an acute phase, like right away, um, before the 24 hours, uh, they may have a heart attack. You may see hypokinesis happening in this area, for example, um, but <clears throat> the shape doesn't necessarily change in less than 24 hours. It's at 24 to 72 hours, it becomes the most weakened, and that's where you start to see the change. Okay, it's caused by various things the the wall becomes weaker and weaker and, and more susceptible to stretching for one uh for two as i'm squeezing if this heart was squeezing the acute one on here uh, if it was squeezing uh these walls would squeeze normally but this area would not squeeze normally it may be akinetic it may be hypokinetic uh that means that this blood flow is not being pushed out as effectively as it was before the heart attack 
right? So that cumulative back pressure and the volume is going to contribute to an increased level of pressure inside there, which causes this stretching to happen. So not only do we have a weaker wall, but because uh, over the 24 hour period or more, uh, we're building up pressure and volume in this as well. Okay, and this is continuing to not squeeze properly, uh, which makes this worse and worse. Once we get to that six week phase or area, that's when uh, it starts to stabilize and, and become stronger and, and stable at least. Okay, if we do have a free wall rupture, that is usually fatal. Um, fewer of them are recorded on echo. Uh, instanta uh, inst instantaneous accumulation of mass, compressive uh, pericardial hemorrhage and death uh, may occur with this. So, Basically, it's bleeding. So if it ruptures, just like that picture I showed you, it goes out into the pericardium. Uh, the bigger that gets, the more pressure outside the heart there becomes. The heart's already weak, and now it's influenced by these external pressures in addition to that. So these are usually uh, fatal. So culprit coronary would be right coronary then? Uh, could be. It, it doesn't have to be in that particular picture. If that's where the arrows are pointing and that's the wall that's affected, that would be the case, yes. Um, it, it depends on where it is. But it could be circumflex as well because circumflex uh, services the lateral wall, which doesn't have any septum. Uh, or it could be the right ventricular free wall as well. We often talk about the left heart uh, issues or regional wall segments of that, but keep in mind that right heart can also have a heart attack. It can also have these ruptures and stuff like that also. Oh, so this is the left ventricular free wall? In this particular case here, yeah. I think there's some slides coming up talking about the right, but okay, okay. the stuff that happens in the left could also be happening in the right. The left's got the higher pressure, go, you know, flow, flow goes to the brain. It's just uh, typically more focused on because of the uh, need that it has to supply blood more intensely. All right, ventricular thrombus. So ventricular thrombus is a common thing. A again, the apex going out is a common thing. So we want to pay particular attention to that. But um, so if we're not seeing it and we think that there's some uh, wall motion abnormalities there, we need to pay particular attention to the flow going into the apex to see that it's not starting to thrombose. Uh, particularly the more hours that go by, um, we want to see that if, if it's been days and weeks. Uh, and we've got scarring and aneurysms and things like that. We want to pay attention very closely to the apex. So in that case, you'd want to use your uh, <clears throat> your echo enhancement agents to be able to light up the chamber and see where the flow actually is versus uh, the thrombus that might be hiding. Um, <clears throat> majority of these are going to be anteroapical. And I put in parentheses, what view is that? Mm, two chamber. Two Three chamber. chamber. I'm going to see it the best, yeah. Um, peak timing is uh, roughly 72 hours, so that's when it starts to form thrombus, or that you start to see it enough. Uh, it may be laminar, pedunculated, or mobile. So what does all that mean? What does laminar mean, do you think? We talk about laminar flow, we talk about those layers of flow, right? So a laminar type of thrombus is more smooth. It forms through the wall. It's close to the wall. It doesn't really protrude out anywhere. Uh, what does pedunculated mean? That means that there's like a stalk or an area where it, it kind of is attached to the wall, but it kind of hangs out into the, into the fluid. And so that could be pretty mobile. mobile. Um, pedunculated and mobile. So if it's, if it's peeling away from the wall at all and kind of hanging out into the tissue, um, that's less stable than one that's laminar. Laminar is the more stable version. If it's pedunculated, that's less stable. And if it's mobile and it was moving around with the heart beating, uh, that's even less stable and more likely to break off and cause an embolism to the brain or other organs. Uh, so those things we want to uh, definitely document and uh, document the type of, of thrombus that it is. Uh, anticoagulation therapy might be used. Um, patients are still at risk for recurrence. So if, if they do have thrombus and they sort of treat it, that doesn't mean that they can't develop new thrombus. Um, so they may have to uh, be medicated for a while with anticoagulation. 
the right and the right ventricle. So again, we don't want to forget that because there's people that have heart attacks on the right heart. Okay, they, they may come out and their left heart looks great, but they're having definite symptoms. Um, so we, we can't exclude that. It's still a heart muscle. So greater than 90% of these are with the inferior uh, MI. So most of the right ventral free wall is uh, supplied by the inferior, um, or it goes with the inferior right uh, MI, which is the right corner artery. Uh, frank dilation, which means like sudden or obvious uh, dilation. And akinesis may not even be seen or noticed because it's a harder uh, chamber to see the entire thing. Uh, you might have a low uh, tricuspid regurgitation velocity without the change really to the regurgitation itself. Um, so if it gets a low velocity, that, that could be because the ventricle isn't squeezing as hard as it was before, uh, which is a sign of a heart attack. Uh, transient increased right heart pressures. Um, you might have some atrial septal bowing from right to left. Um, again, if it's pushing from right to left, what does that tell me the pressure is? Right, right heart. So the right has more pressure, which it definitely should not have, right? Uh, so that, that indicates that we've got a significant discrepancy in pressures between left and right heart from what the normal situation is. Uh, that could possibly open TFOs um, and transient right to left shunting with contrast. Okay, so if we're doing the bubble studies uh, with the saline bubble studies, uh, we'll see the left to right shunting. Are you going to see this the um, shunting if you're using a Definity or Lunasun? Maybe very very briefly, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be not good. in the right heart because it goes to the lungs and. Yeah, so any shunting, remember the contrast we want to use is definitely the agitated saline. Good. Well, unless there's a transpulmonary shunt though, right? Yes, and if there is, then again, you want uh, agitated saline as well. You do not want the, uh, the LVO type of contrast, the um, definities and lunasons are not helpful because it goes equally through. Um, <clears throat> they might have relevant uh, clinical hypoxia. So again, anything affecting the right heart is going to naturally affect the organ it supplies, which is the lungs uh, and all that it does. Substantially worse prognosis if uh, it's concurrent with a VSV or, uh, or mitral regurgitation, uh, just affecting the overall workload of the heart. So if you've got those in conjunction with a dilated heart that's uh, got some wall motion abnormalities, that's even worse. Okay, acute MR. So going off of the right heart. So again, we know that MR can be affected by uh, a heart attack in the left heart because it's attached to the mitral valve apparatus, being the papillary muscles, choroid, tendon, et cetera, even the free wall of the, of the left ventricle. Uh, so we could have rupture or partial rupture of the papillary valve. So we're looking for any flail leaflet type situations. We're obviously doing color Doppler on the valve itself to see if there's any significant bleed. Uh, post remedial papillary muscle is the, con the most common uh, because it has one single blood supply. It doesn't have the overlapping uh, like the other one does. So that's the uh, post remedial muscle, which is closer to the septal wall. Uh, left atria is usually normal size um, acutely because maybe we get a big regurgitation, but the LA hasn't had time to adapt and increase in size. Okay, so that's a clue that it might be acute versus chronic. Uh, they, if you were to uh, listen to their heart, uh, there might be a new uh, holosystolic murmur being all the way across the cycle. So just like we, our holosystolic murmur that we have normally with the mitral regurgitation, uh, that's a new one that came up that they didn't maybe have before. It wasn't nearly as strong. Um, <clears throat> the differential is obviously an acute uh, VSV. So an acute VSV means uh, basically a new VSV that's come out. And I put obviously in parentheses because they, they said obviously it's as if you're, you know, should know that obviously. I just thought it was kind of funny. But we're echo tech, not doctors. I wouldn't have suspected that, but okay. <laughs> uh, okay, flail uh, results in eccentric jet as we talked about before. So it's opposite of the leaflet that's, uh, that's the problem which is the direction of the jet itself. 
Um, <clears throat> direct visualization of the papillary muscle head uh, rupture is difficult on PPE, but uh, color can be evident. So you may see that uh, the head of that, you know, popping back and forth out of the mitral valve or through the mitral valve area, um, but you may not because uh, we, we do have a harder time seeing it. But the color will be quite evident when you stick it. Uh, but if you can see it in 2D, that usually means it's going to be pretty bad in uh, goblet. Uh, acute MR can also be from tethering of the mitral valve leaflet. So again, it might not be because something is ruptured. It might be because that wall is stretching out and pulling those, ape, those uh, papillary muscles with it towards the apex, which is away from the mitral valve. Again, the chordae tendon are, are holding the valve leaflet. So if they get pulled further away, that tightens the cords and that may not let the leaflets come and actually attach or collapse together. So it's leaving a gap. So it might not be because it's broken or something like that. It might just be because they're getting pulled further back. Um, three to five percent of uh, transmural or Q wave MIs uh, have ventricular septal rupture. Um, they can occur anywhere along the septum. So again, you don't want to just evaluate one single slice and say, uh, give your diagnosis. You, want, you need to look at the entire septum with color Doppler all the way up and down in transverse and in long axis, and probably also in subcostal views. Anytime you can see the septum, look at the entire thing if you suspect uh, something's going on. Um, <clears throat> you want to scan perpendicular to the septum. So again, that's why the um, the uh, subcostal view is best because you get the best perpendicular view to it. Uh, these don't necessarily form direct holes. It goes straight across. They can be uh, circumgent. In other words, they're tortuous. They can be like serpent, like they kind of snake through the muscle. So it may not be directly to it. So you're looking for these little tiny channels that may, may go straight across and they may you know, go across and up into a different location. Um, so just you know, don't expect the jet to go straight through necessarily. Uh, with echo, the overall LV function is important. Um, the presence of any pulmonary hypertension and the function of the RV itself. So what? Let me just ask you. So the rest is pretty simple. But how do you assess the function, the systolic function of the right ventricle? DPDT. Okay, you could use DPDT with a TR jet. That's good. What else do we use? What do you do in lab routinely? Ven right ventricular systolic pressure estimation. Okay, so we'll take some Dopplers. That will tell us that stuff. But what about the uh, TDI? TDI could be helpful, yeah. What about M mode? Okay, so TAPSI. TAPSI is one of the, the recently more common uh, ways of evaluating right ventricular systolic function. So TAPSI is a good uh, use for it. If, uh, if we have global stuff, uh, the LV, global LV systolic function uh, compromise, there's a substantially worse prognosis. So uh, if, again, we have that ventricular septal defect or rupture, um, having a compromised systolic function makes it even worse. Uh, concurrent VSD and RV infarction also makes it substantially worse. So basically, if your left or right heart is bad and you have VSD, that's a worse prognosis or worse outcome. All right, and cardiogenic shock. So this uh, is present with a combination of congestive heart failure and malperfusion. So malperfusion is just not getting the blood through the muscle tissue. Uh, they may have severe LV pump failure. Uh, or just that the LV is not working well. Uh, there could be acute severe MR. There could be VSD, uh, right ventricle myocardial infarction as well, uh, or cardiac tamponade, uh, in addition to less common and severe pathology. So there could be also some other stuff going on as well. Uh, what is cardiac tamponade? We haven't really covered that yet in detail. I saw Irina's mouth moving. I didn't hear stuff. I don't know if you're talking to me. Yeah, I was thinking like cardiac tamponade when is there's some liquid or something stuck in around the heart and heart cannot move. It's cannot expand. 
So generally speaking, yeah, that's that's right. So that's often what causes the problem. And so it could be a fluid collection around there and or pressure. Regardless, is the, the pressure around the outside of the heart is increased significantly, uh, causing a hemodynamic, significant hemodynamic change in the heart. It is a, an emergent situation. So if you get a patient in cardiac tamponade, uh, they need to be moving on it quickly. Okay, so if you notice it, document it appropriately quickly and then get the information to the doctor and they may have you finish the exam while they're starting to get stuff ready to do something about it. Uh, but it is an emergent uh, procedure. Um, and yes, it's generally caused by that fluid collection in the uh, pericardium, uh, that extra cardiac space um, that causes uh, the big problems. And we'll talk more about that uh, coming up in a different lecture. Uh, transesophageal may be better if nothing is detected by the transthoracic echo. So in other words, um, we don't usually just jump to a TE, uh, TEE if we don't see things very good, but if you suspect tamponade and something's going on, we're going to do whatever we can to see if that's what we see. And T, TEE is uh, better. Most importantly, uh, pump function and severity of the MR on cardiogenic shock. So let me just break down the term real quick, cardiogenic shock. What does that mean exactly? It's decreased cardiac output because heart cannot pump up enough blood and we have decreased like uh, blood pressure over the body, so. Okay, good. So the body responds to shock. What is shock to the body? How does the body respond to shock? What is shock? So it's severe decrease of blood pressure. So the body tend to increase blood pressure by activating different system like in the renal and uh, body receptors. Good, good. So shock is that overall drop in volume. So that could be because we get a severed artery or somehow the blood supply gets compromised and we're leaking blood out, right? Uh, it could be because um, something is damaged in the heart and the heart's simply not squeezing correctly, okay? Uh, or it could be like a vascular cause or something like that as well. But these shocks, generally speaking, um, other forms of shock could be like a neurological type of shock where the brain tells that, you know, because of major trauma, uh, something happens. It could be an emotional trauma or it could be physical trauma. Um, tells all the blood vessels to dilate at one time. You know that the body only holds about five to six liters of blood, but it could hold 10 to 12. So if we increase all the, or dilate all the vessels at once, that drops our blood volume in half, it pulls away from the brain, we have shock. Um, <clears throat> again, the leakiness out of the, out of the uh, cardiovascular system is bad, uh, but it could be caused from the heart. So the cardiogenic suggests that it's the heart uh, is the genesis or the origin of that problem. Uh, so cardiogenic shock means that the heart is the problem that we're not getting that blood supply when we need to. And that, in this case, that's because we've had the heart attack, we've got the, the regional or global wall motion problems, and the patient is dying because of it. Okay, so we're having shock symptoms because of the heart. Okay, so there could be a few reasons for shock, but cardiogenic shock is specifically heart cause. Good. Any questions on this stuff at this point? We've got one more lecture on it, so we'll go into some more details uh, next class tomorrow. Good, so we are at 11.28. Yeah, I need a break. Holy cow, I thought we were gonna get I done eight minutes ago. <laughs> Why don't we come back in about, say 10 minutes, is that good, or 15? Can we get 15 minutes? Oh. Some of us also have to scan soonish too, so we don't want to push too far. But yeah, what? Our, the presentations actually shouldn't take that long anyway. Uh, let's give it fifteen, and uh, we'll keep it short on the uh, presentation side. But we'll get what we need to. But uh, it will be good. Scott, do we have a link for the Zoom uh, on on the uh, next? I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this Zoom open. So keep it going. Just gonna uh, mute out for a minute. And uh, just, I'll just leave this running. Uh, I am going to cut off the uh, lecture on Panopto, though, so we don't have a super long Panopto. But 